Monster archetypes. The god and father of all monsters. Golems. The monster professor returns again to the podcast. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. Now, guys, it is so cool to be back with you, even though I hope you didn't even notice that I left for a little while. My wife and I had a baby, so I stacked up a whole bunch of episodes. So this is the first time that I am recording audio in 2021, and it is a blast to be back with you. Now, guys, I have an incredible episode for you today. So we're just going to jump into the interview with the Monster Professor. My guest today is a writer, a professor, and a monster expert, as well as the host of the Monster Professor podcast, Josh Woods. Josh, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me on again, Matt. Uh, big fan of your show. Congratulations, by the way, on continued success and awesome guests that you have. Uh, not perhaps not including me, but I'm really happy to be back again. I think this makes I think four on your show and two on my show of, of time. So six total times we've teamed up together and we always seem to run out of time to dig into the monsters we want to talk about. And it's always great fun for me. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I know we usually try to uh, tackle three kind of topics or monsters at a time, and we could probably just talk about one. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, we normally but, get through one, one and a half, and then an hour has gone. Yeah, yeah, and then I look down, and yeah, we we have to finish up in 20 minutes. <laughs> <Something>. <laughs> but um, it is always a good time to have you on the show, and I do love talking about monsters because in the tabletop role-playing game space, um, we deal with monsters all the time. And so uh, anytime I can talk to a monster expert, I consider it a good day. <laughs> <laughs> and so today we have, again, we pick three. So uh, uh, kind of ambitiously. Um, so we're going to see if we can get through these. So we're going to talk a little later on about uh, the golem and the God and father of all monsters. But first uh, you had kind of uh, suggested an interesting topic and that is monster archetypes. And now since you are the monster expert, can you kind of first tell us what a, a monster archetype would be? And then um, maybe we can talk about some of the different types that you're looking into. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for going there. I was wondering if whether I should hold that one back because I might get caught in, a, in my own little like swirling eddy of ideas here because really <laughs> it's ideas I'm still playing with. I'm, I'm working on a book right now that's kind of a bridge between popular audiences and academic uh, kind of theoretical literature stuff, essentially about, about how horror stories function even beyond the market genre of horror. And that's, the, and that's a weird concept that takes a while to tease out, but the basics of it is you can have a horror story that is horrific with like monsters or killers or these kinds of things. But I think, I think there's a, a fundamental structure of the horror tale that can be told even in types of stories that aren't horrific in content yet they still hold a structure and it's and it's a lot like you know the hero's journey is this is this archetypical uh, tale type of tale structure that doesn't have to be about a hero with a sword it could be a, a toy story characters right you could go on the hero's journey or, or something like that so so that works in horror too and as i'm working through this book i get i get to this point where i need to spend a lot of time on monsters and how monsters work structurally or archetypically and and so i think there's maybe the clearest way to uh to distinguish what i think a monster archetype is is trying to figure out what kinds of monsters are there beyond just uh, the taxonomy of monsters? Although the taxonomy of monsters is cool. <laughs> I mean, and by taxonomy, I mean like, you know, 
what are the branches of what their what their embodiment is in a story like you could have some monsters that are well tom shippy broke down a very cool monster taxonomy in his mind you can have artificial monsters and natural monsters and then they start branching out from there what kinds of artificial what kinds of natural and i see it a little bit differently i i, I see i see how uh, there seem to be just a few types of monsters and 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 how they interact with us or how they affect us, us normally being the victims of them when they're monsters. <laughs> and, and what kind of fear is at the heart of this kind of monster and what this kind of monster goes after. And there really seems to be only about three to four main types but I'm still playing out with these ideas. And so I thought I would just throw them out there, bounce them off of you, see what you think. Uh, so uh, should we go into the types as I see them or, or should I back up? Did I speed past a, a complex topic too much? What, well, um, you know, I, I think it is kind of a complex topic, but uh, and I'm certainly not an a- an academic, <laughs> um, um, but I think uh, I think I got the concept here. So yeah, why don't you hit me with your, uh, your types of monsters and then I can, uh, bring my unschooled opinion in and, and either throw off your work or, uh, do something else <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. Cause you might very well point out how it's all complete garbage. And then I might have to scrap the whole chapter and throw away the book and freak out. So, so <laughs> oh, no, uh, hopefully just keep, happen. keep that in mind. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, that, um, so I think like the, the three that are, that are clearest to me at this point, and they seem like this for a while is the, the archetype of the beast, then the unliving, and then the, the daemon or the demon, you know, how, when you see demon yeah. spelled with the D A E M O N, uh, which is kind of it incorporates demons and other things, but those seem to be the, the major one. I have a fourth category that I'm struggling with. And so maybe I'll, I'll like share very briefly what I think those three entail and then tell you the one I'm, I can't quite figure out. Okay. Um, the the beast are, are those monsters that are um, essentially they pre- they present a physical threat. Um, those that you know with their own bodies and to our own bodies. So and these are the ones like driven by animalistic appetites and instincts. And so ven- essentially, you know, those kinds of monsters, what they do or what makes them monstrous or supernaturally powerful has to do with like exaggerations of things you already see in real life predatory beasts. They're they're big, they're strong, they're fast, they're agile, they're stealthy, they have natural weapons which are on their bodies and very often they want to either eat us or maybe even infect us rabies like uh in in a very kind of animalistic hunger like way um and so and i think that you know perhaps the most famous uh, of the or the most iconic i guess i should say the beast monsters might be like the werewolf right Mm -hmm. Uh, but i think you could even have thing everything from um you know, the, the xenomorph aliens uh, are, are essentially a, a combination of different types of predatory animals all the way up to, you know, something like Godzilla rampaging around like a, like a mad animal. Um, and so, and, and so I think that, you know, and the kind of fear, the kind of fear that they invoke is a, is a very physical fear. You're worried about them killing you or, or ripping you apart or infecting you or something. And, and I think that's one type. And I think that's essentially different from say the unliving and unliving is the type of monster that, that lacks uh, something something vital to what we see of as life. Like they lack some type of soul or vitality or autonomy, something that makes them an actual individual living creature, something about them that is part of the other side 
of reality that we're not allowed to cross into, which is the, the death. Um, and, you know, they, they might like, they might still like hunger forth with hunger, like zombies want to eat our brains, but they're not actually hungry and it doesn't seem to sustain them. <laughs> they're just, they're, they're, they're shambling along mimicking what life is like, like a werewolf wants to eat you. He wants to eat you for real. Cause he's actually hungry and that's going to give him calories to burn while he goes and chases down other people. And that's different from these things like, or these robots shambling towards you. Um, or even, or even, um, I think there, I think there can be a couple of subtypes for some of these. And I think, you know, for the unliving, you could have the corporeal and the incorporeal, which is like the, the corporeal, you could have like, uh, the kind of fear that are are invoked by robots or by zombies and the kinds of things they do and how they interact, like single-minded, they have no sense of goals for themselves beyond some basic kind of program toward them, uh, in them. Um, you have that kind, but I think you can also have the same kind of monster, this I'm living in the incorporeal things that, that they have what they're lacking is, is not so much that soul or vitality. Well, they, they do that. <laughs> it's not like they're lacking all the incorporeal qualities. They lack the corporeal qualities of life, which is like having a body or something <laughs> like a ghost or a wraith, but they, but they only have some of the incorporeal qualities and that we have maybe some memory, maybe some expression like to moan and to, and to have anger left over, but no, no real sense of autonomy or soul or will or all these other things that we see in ourselves is, is essential to life. And I think where the, where the, the ultimate fear of the beast is you don't want to get eaten (laughs) or so or infected or or whatever. Um, But I think the ultimate fear of the unliving is something more existential. Like it's a, it's a deeper kind of numinous fear. Um, something well, the beast makes us worry about what's going to happen to us in this world and the unliving makes us worry about what's going to happen to us in perhaps the next world. And, and so that's why I think the unliving can be everything from, from these things that creep us out about like zombies about what does this mean after I die? And what, why, what about this thing is, is scary. It's just a, it's just like a, a really weird drug addict who wants to bite your head. Right. But because we know it's dead, it has a deeper fear than that. Um, and, and I think that can go all the way through say ring wraiths all the way up to AI, you know, like the, like the, like the AI in uh, 2001 Space Odyssey or, or Skynet or something like this, this thing that only like, oh, I'm sorry, I've calculated that humanity is a cancer on the planet and must be eliminated for the good of the planet. And it's like you can't talk any sense into it because it lacks a soul, right? And that's, it's a deep existential fear. So those are, those are the first two major types you know, that I see. And I think the distinction between them can kind of clarify why, or the comparison between the two, I think can clarify why I see them as two different archetypes. So how am I doing so far? (laughs) Do you think, do you think I'm running (laughs) off the rails on this or what? (laughs) No, no, I, I think it, I think it's fascinating. And, um, you know, being a non monster expert, I've never tried to classify them like this but I, I see where you're going with with some of them and i i do find it fascinating uh to to place them there my first thought was what about the vampire he's unliving yeah. but he does need blood right yeah yeah the the i think that's uh weirdly uh, and not to not to cheat my or shortcut my way out of that one because i think it's a very interesting kind of it, it it mixes both of those categories seemingly completely, or at least the Dracula version or the versions of Dracula have done that previous vamp- vampires before Dracula almost always seemed more wraith or zombie like, or, or, or something like that. And, yeah. 
And then drag in, in comes Dracula and it has this passionate kind of hunger and this lustfulness, which is a very beast like thing, right? This going after mm-hmm. something lustfully or, or gluttonously. Uh, and so I think you do, I think Dracula, um, wraps all that up, both the fear of undeath and the fear of the beast all in one. And so as I'm sorting that out, it's like, is that really a complete mix of the two? At which point these archetypes are kind of useless. I don't know. <laughs> it might, it might be, but it also seems like every time you you see that tale done, starting with the original Bram Stoker, you you tend to see the storyteller or the director focus in on more on the beast or the unliving than the other one. Right. So Francis Ford Coppola does it's Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula you know, <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the 90s when he did that. And it was a very bestial Dracula. He was Gary Oldman is sexy and is the sexiest as he's ever been. Right. <laughs> and, he's, and he's constantly and he's constantly having sex with with all these women. He's he's seducing through magic and he's turning into a werewolf and and a bat. And and there wasn't much much death in him the all the the first version you see with the big bun uh, the haircut kind of thing it's a little bit more death like but he transforms into this bestial version but then you have like murnau's nosferatu which very much seems like a a a shadowy wraith-like death thing and so i i think you know, that's, that's, I guess, one of the reasons why I think in these archetypes, it's as a storyteller, when you're trying to write your own fiction, write your own novel, um, you got to kind of be aware of, am I mixing in ideas that just don't seem to fit together? Like, am I, is there something essentially different about this type of character or this kind of kit, what this character is doing than another. And, and sooner or later, I think a lot of writers start thinking in, in these kinds of archetypes. And, and so that's, and so that's one key. Like, I don't think it succeeds if you try to emphasize the existential undeadness of Dracula and you try to emphasize this bestial living hunger and lust of Dracula it's kind of too much to emphasize altogether because they're two different archetypes. And so I think you see a lot of, uh, a lot of storytellers take Dracula and pick one route or another, and they don't, they don't mix so easily. Some in, in moments it can be, but I don't know. So that's where, that's where I'm playing that idea. I haven't written that out yet. It, the more I think about it, it might not hold up, but there it is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> No, like I said, it was, it, it's all fascinating. And, um, I, I do enjoy thinking about these things maybe weirdly, but, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, like I said, with the, my experience with tabletop role-playing games, you know, everything's monsters. So if I can figure out how to make my monsters, um, you know, more engaging for my players, that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking to do. So you had a third archetype. Yeah. Well, I mean, since you bring up, yeah, the the third one, uh, but since you bring up, you know, monsters and role playing, I mean, Mm -hmm. maybe it's just me, but it just always felt wrong when you go into a dungeon or deep into these caves as a, as an adventurer and you run into a tribe of orcs and, you know, some, some skeletons all hanging out in the same room. Right. It just doesn't, they don't, they just shouldn't go together. It doesn't feel right together. Those are two different kinds. They exist in two different worlds and they can't convince me that the orcs would feel comfortable with these skeletons. (laughs) Like there is, it was, and nor would the skeletons like not necessarily want to, to bring the orcs over to the other side of the, through the veils of death, they just won't get along. <laughs> and you could contrive a reason. It's just not going to feel right. I don't think because they're two different archetypes. But. Yeah, no. And I, I definitely agree with that um, because I, I think usually when I try to make a dungeon or I'm going to populate it, um, you know, sometimes I'll mix things up a little bit, but um um it doesn't it seems like if there's orcs hanging out there i mean goblins make sense ogres make sense giants make sense but you're absolutely right it doesn't seem like you would then just put skeletons or you know some type of wraith or ghosts or something 
you know, else like that. It's like those things would scare away the orcs <laughs> or something, right? They just wouldn't even want to live there if it was haunted in that way. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it is occurring to me that Tolkien kind of did that, you know, with having wraiths like command bands of orcs in the armies of Mordor. But mm -hmm. But even then, he took time to to you know clarify how freaked out the orcs were <laughs> yeah. by the right thing around. Yeah. You know, they didn't like it. Yeah, and I, I think that I think that is a, a very powerful distinction there that um, that they were afraid and they were being forced to to do that by you know the wraith is their leader. the The wraith is not just some creature that's in you know room twelve on your dungeon and then the orcs are in room 14 or something like that. Um, you know, the, the, the undead, like commanding living armies, I can totally see that um, because they could enthrall them. They could, they could terrify them. They could torture them. Obviously Sauron uh, was manufacturing orcs as well um, yeah. in some ways. And so um, these are just creatures that he is making so he can unleash them on living people um um and uh you know so I, I think that totally works but when they're just like if it's just a group of you know if it's just a group of skeletons and a group of orcs hanging out in a room you know maybe uh you, you probably need a little bit better explanation for that than you know or just say hey i, I made up this dungeon on the fly and i, I rolled random encounter skeletons and i rolled <laughs> random encounter orcs and uh you know if you don't like it somebody else can uh, uh be the dungeon master or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. And so, you know, we're talking about like these monsters in a room and we're not the in these kinds of fears and we're not the first like C.S. Lewis, you know, I think wrote brilliantly about and C.S. Lewis uh, for everybody listening, you might like, isn't he the lion, the witch in the wardrobe yes. guy? Mm -hmm. that, like, yep, yeah, that's the dude. But he was also, well, as you, as you know, quite well, Matt, like he's also a brilliant uh, essentially Christian philosopher, theologian, mm -hmm. or maybe just flat out philosopher in, philosopher, in general. But, yeah. 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 And, and he's, and he was trying to sort that out. He was said something like, if you were told that there's a tiger in the next room, like you would, you, you would know you were in danger and you'd feel fear, but that's different if you were told there's a ghost in the next room yeah. and you, you would feel something like fear, but it's of a different kind. And, and that's what this is. It's yeah. something more uncanny, something that excites dread. And, and that's, he says, then you're on the fringes of the numinous. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, this, that's something that, that, that the unliving does to us, which is yeah. different from what the beast does. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because he, he makes that distinction and he says, you know, you're afraid of what a tiger can do to you, um, but you're not afraid of what a tiger is because we understand that. But if it's a ghost, we don't know what it can do to us. It may not be able to do anything to us, but we're afraid of it because of what it is. Right. And um, because we don't understand that um, at all. Yeah. Yeah. That existential fear. It's not just about our own existence. It's about its existence. Yes. Like what, what it, and that this thing is here. What does that mean about the universe itself? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 So all that. And yeah. that, and that third one, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, and I call it, I call it the, the demon or the daemon um, because, you know, I think there's so well, here's what I think the thing is first. <laughs> and then, I, then I'll explain my struggle with naming it. It's these kinds of monsters that aren't the, I mean, they could maybe seem beast like, or they could maybe seem undead like, or, or, or something else or a spirit. But, but what makes them essentially different is they're primarily concerned with, with meddling with, human lives or intruding on our lives or exploiting human lives or sabotaging human lives. Like their focus is on, on us. There's something like people possess or people contain that this monster wants. It's like, it's here for people like a thief is in your house for money or something like that, I guess. And that's different from say a lot of the beast monsters or a lot of the undead monsters who might not even know that you exist as a human being, mm -hmm. except maybe for your food for the taking for some of them. But mm -hmm. the werewolf 
might not need humans. It can eat deer. Right? <laughs> Robots don't need humans, but there's a kind of monster that does. And so to get what they want, and they can't just go take it like a beast, like, like the, this kind of monster can't just rip open your chest and take your soul or, or force your hand to sign a contract or something like that. Like they need to make some sort of bargain with you, or they need to seduce you or trick you or trap you or manipulate you or, or offer their own services and these kind of dark bargains. And, and I think that's the, that's the daemon. And, and I think this includes you know, demons proper, but other kinds of spirits too, or, or those that make these kind of bargain like things like witches, genies, fae, um, all sorts of devils and deal makers. Um, and even, even those that manipulate and trick, like, like the doppelganger or even trickster, the trickster and the trickster tales, I think is this, is this kind of very odd one, maybe not all trickster tales, but this kind of a trickster like thing is more of of the daemon and that's and that kind of monster is after something different than just the unliving and the beast it is and it interacts with us differently uh or it seems bound by having to interact with human beings differently and the fears that it kind of brings up they're just they're different than those exist the the danger for your well-being fears or the existential fears the, they pull on on something different and so i think you can have what is technically something like well this is, might be a dumb example, but it's the, the first one to come to my head. So I'm going to go with it. Beetlejuice. Let's take Beetlejuice from the Tim Burton movie, right? <laughs> like he's technically a ghost guy who kind of looks like a, a funny zombie, but he's like, he's a ghost. He's the ghost with the most as he proclaims. Right. And, uh, but he also has this very animalistic like behavior. Like he has all these body function humor going along with him. He's very lusty. He's uh, if he's not trying to have sex, he's trying to eat while he's trying, but his main focus is to try to get people to do something for him. Cause he, needs people to let him get out and have fun so you could say he's beast-like or he's unliving but what what makes him function as a as a character in that narrative is is the daemon is this thing that it needs to it, it needs other people to get what it's want, it wants and it will trick it will deceive it will seduce it will manipulate it will strike bargains it will do anything that it can uh, and I think that's a whole category of of monster so so th those are the three main ones uh, there's a fourth that I struggle with <laughs> but those are the three that are clearer to mine so what do you think about that well uh, no I, th I think it is interesting i mean that uh because there there are a, a set of of you know monsters that that do you know seem you know that seemingly do require people to either let them out like a genie like a genie just can't even do anything unless they get let out of the lamp or whatever yeah. and um uh or um of course i'm i'm a total nerd so I'll, I'll go back to maybe like say the original star trek had a couple like kind of space entities that needed that fed off fear or or anger and they were always you know they were manipulating uh the crew to get those feelings and huh. um and and things like that and um so i i think that is a definite kind of category that and it does play on some of our fears right that we're that perhaps we're being played right <laughs> we're being yeah. <laughs> we're we're just an instrument in these supernatural creatures game right yeah yeah and the, and the and the kind of trouble that you're into is now even more clearly your fault uh, once you're the one. Say, if you're the one who like raised Audrey to from a little Venus flytrap, and you're the one that's been feeding it <laughs> because it it might get you a money and a girlfriend, right? Then you turn it into this world-eating monster. Uh, that's a different kind of fear than just being attacked by a giant man-eating monster it's or if it's not a fear it's a, it it works in stories and tales differently than than just a just an attacking monster does 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then you said you're struggling with a fourth. Yeah, you know the okay, so essentially beasts are are a beast is at its heart is, is a lot of chaos. And, and I think uh-huh. that's at the heart of Typhon. Uh, uh, I don't, I, now nah, I don't even know if we're going to get, <laughs> get to him now, but, <laughs> but, uh, as I feared anyway, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I think at the heart it's, it's chaos, it, it's animalistic. It's, it, it's, it's kind of like anarchical, but you know, the, the various kinds of giants or, or the monstrous Titan like things so often, not always, but so often in stories seem to function almost like the opposite of, of the dragon, you know, the, or this, or the serpent or the, or the beast that not so much like the chaotic id released in all its passions, but something closer to overbearing tyranny, like, you know, not, you're not caught in the jungle with this thing running around like wild slobbering, but instead a lot of these giant type of things seem to function more like you're in a cold prison within a pyramid and the evil overlord King on his throne, you know, won't, won't let you out all the way down to like, I don't know, Polyphemus, you know, has a, as a tyrannical kind of control over Odysseus and his crew. Like he wants to hold them down and won't let them out. It seems, it seems to be like almost the, the tyrant of order uh, 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 is almost like on the far end of the, from the dragon of chaos archetypically, but the giant just doesn't I don't know. It just doesn't seem like the, not all giants do that. And it doesn't seem to kind of balance out these archetypes. And, and so I'm kind of struggling with the, you know, with the Skeletor or with the, the single overlord tyrant, who's this kind of monster that wants too much order and too much control over things. It feels different, but I don't know what the hell to call it or, or what kind of monster <laughs> that even is, or if I'm getting into villains rather than monsters at that point. And so that's, I'm still playing, I'm still working through that idea. So if you have any help for me, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think the, the idea you just said it there at the end, the, the, the villain or the monster, and I'm not sure, um, exactly how to break those out but my first thought as you were talking earlier and you said it right at the beginning of when you started explaining your fourth catalog or category i was thinking of the chaos monsters like tiamat or something that yeah. or or rahab or uh that this you know what is that or is it or is it a cosmic terror you know kind of from lovecraft or something that um you know or are they monsters i i don't i i still struggle with the definition sometimes i know we've talked about that on previous podcasts but um you know is is this the spirit of you know the ancient akkadian you know cosmology you know tiamat is that is that a monster or is tiamat just you know the embodiment of disorder in some way or is disorder a monster in itself yeah yeah and i think that's well maybe that's kind of a segue to to touch on and typhon ever so briefly because i because <laughs> uh you know and I'm not so much of a scholar that I'm afraid of making wild suppositions (laughs) on record. (laughs) You know, when you talk to real scholars and stuff, they're like, well, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare, you know, throw out a a supposition on that. I wouldn't dare throw out my guess. Like it's, this is being recorded because you know, that'll, those kinds of things will ruin real people's careers, but I don't care about throwing out (laughs) ideas. And so here's, here's what I, I, I think that Typhon uh, or Typhoeus from Greek mythology I think he's the, um, I think he's the Greek take on Tiamat. Uh, and, and I think that story got over to the Greeks and they reworked him. I, I think they kind of split him up between Typhoeus, Typhoeus and Echidna uh, or Echidna. Uh, but yeah, to get back to like your main question, like, 
you know, your, your question, like, is that, is that natural force of chaos? Is that a monster or is it the embodiment of it in something like Tiamat, the, the ancient Mesopotamian, you know, mother dragon of chaos? Is that a monster? Well, I think, I think absolutely. Yes. Because I think that's essentially the most monstrous type of thing. I think you could argue that maybe that's why we have monsters because there are these there are these big things that are that are too they're too potent to kind of grab on to abstractly or maybe the opposite of it they're too they're too uh, you know ethereal to grab on to abstractly and and a monster can help embody that and it can pack in a whole lot more than any one storyteller can really get to right and so mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of like you, what Jung said about a symbol. It's as separate from allegory. He, he said something to the effect of like, allegory is like a summary or, or a paraphrase of an idea you already know, but but a symbol is the best possible representation you have of what is essentially unknown. And, and I think that's I think that's one of the great power of monsters is we can play around with these really cool things and know a lot about them, but the best monsters have at their heart a connection to some, or they are something bigger than what we can ever really know. Um, yeah. So she's a monster. All right. She's the coolest one. One of the coolest. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, you know, I know you gave your disclaimer about, uh, saying things. Um, I of course am a non academic who's read just about enough to make himself dangerous. So I I say stuff, (laughs) I say stuff all the time, but, um, I, I think there is something and like, obviously I have not thought about, you know, monsters in a serious way, like, like you have, but to me, there is something always there with the monster and disorder. Um, and, um, like, you know, is it, I think it's Marduk, right. Has to kill Tiamat to make some order out of that chaos. And then, you know, another figure has to, you know, kill this other one, you know, from another mythology, right. There, there's, there's some similarities there, um, in some of the different, you know, ancient mythologies. It's just like, you know, we have to get rid of the monster and then, you know, we can go back to farming again or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I and I think uh, that's at its beginning stages. That's what that's what the monster is, and it, and it, particularly an external kind of disorder or chaos. Um, I think you can track that kind of thing uh, through just looking at monsters in literature. At least that's what I've attempted to do. And mm-hmm. and uh, I think my first few episodes on my podcast were were essentially a, a, you know my lecture uh, a series of monsters that literature chronologically. And I think they kind of work in stages. And I think that first stage uh, when monsters show up in tales and in myths, um, starting with those earliest, uh, whether it's Gilgamesh or even in, in Numa Elish uh, with Marduk and Tiamat. I think it's this external disorder, chaos, this embodiment of it, and you have to kill it and but but not totally dispose of it because it, it holds something of great value mm-hmm. in it. Like the yeah. dragon, uh, you know, has the princess and the treasure, right? You gotta go yeah. kill the dragon yeah. to get those valuable things back, or or you know, even its body itself, like Tiamat's yeah. body is used to to make the world. And and I think as you carry on in, in literature and entails, then you see that externalization kind of internalized, I think first through kind of this concept of sin and and bad things and us. And then I think as the industrial revolution starts or at, or as the romantics, you know, saw it getting nearer and nearer, then you have things like Frankenstein, uh, which start to worry about bigger questions about what we are. And it's no longer just pure chaos or disorder Mm -hmm. all the way up till, well, you get something like the Borg. I think they're Mm -hmm. monsters and I think they're Mm -hmm. what they present is not too much chaos, but too much order, like Mm -hmm. too much assimilation or assimilation. Uh, And so what's the problem with that? Well, 
it's unliving, I think, is the problem with that. It yeah. takes what's the the burning, kind of chaotic, lively part of the human soul, and it strips that away, and it files it in, in, in binary code. And then that's that's a monster. That's a new kind of monster. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I mean, obviously, there's a ton there. And I, I do love the the Borg analogy, uh, especially before the concept of the Borg queen was was introduced when um, it was just these this group of individuals seeking to, you know, they will take if you have one little bit of technology that's better than theirs, they're going to take that. And if, say, the human heart valve is better than the heart valve they have already, they're just going to take that and incorporate that into uh, themselves. And they're just going to move on. And I think it does play on one of our our you know, most profound fears, right? The loss of our identity, right? The loss of our self, because there is just a Borg. There is, you know, there is no you, there is no I, there is just Borg. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like a lot of those kind of, and I think they fit into that unliving archetype. And I think like a lot of those unliving archetypes, you know, at the, at the base or the fear hiding behind the next door of, uh, of what they present is something like, well, if it's an existential worry like that, it can't be stopped. It's going to keep spreading and keep spreading and keep spreading until the whole world is taken, until the whole world is zombies, until every living thing in the galaxy has turned into a Borg. Like the, this virus, this of unlivingness kind of spreads and spreads and spreads. And so there's always something kind of deeply apocalyptic about some of the best unliving tales or even some of the not best and <laughs> some of the bad ones still have something <laughs> lurking in the back of the tail that's different than the beast one. You're not, you know, when you, you're not worried about when you see the wolf man, you're not worried about whether everyone in the whole world is going to turn into a werewolf, but you see a zombie and mm -hmm. that's a real threat or you see the Borg and you're like, that's a real threat. They might take over everything in the universe. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, a lot of fascinating stuff. And uh, I know we touched on Typhon a little bit. That's what I teased at the beginning um, uh, as the God or father of all monsters. And of course that comes from, I think you mentioned uh, the Greek mythology um, and it very well possibly kind of influenced from the earlier Tiamat and and things like that, but in in Greek mythology, right? He is he is basically the father of all monsters, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. So he's um, you know the you can call him Typhon or Typhon or Typhoeus. So the, yeah, I think I it's you know the Homer had Typhoeus, and then it eventually in Latin comes Typhon or something. So mm -hmm. he's got a bunch like anybody cool. You have a bunch of names, whether it's Santa <laughs> Claus or Satan or or. Uh, I don't know anybody. You got a bunch of names if you're cool, um, yeah. and so uh, yeah, he's like he's essentially this this. Uh, well, you know what? And the more I think about it, he's Zeus's uncle. Oh. <laughs> he ends up going. So Zeus has to fight his own weird uncle. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> so uh, like like this original Mesopotamian creation tale. Uh, or something quite close to it, Gaia, which is essentially Mother Earth, um, turns on her grandchildren, and Zeus particularly, who she has been helping out the whole way, uh, turns on him, decides, I need to send monsters after him. And she sends giants, and he wins that battle, and that doesn't work. And so she mates with Tartarus, which is essentially the hell for Greeks it's different than the underworld. It's different than Hades. Like Hades is actually a pretty cool palace. You know, uh, it, it might not be the most jumping place in the world to party, but it's not like Tartarus. Tartarus is bad. Hades still has control over it, but it's, it's slightly different than his underworld. And so this is the really bad place that we would call hell now. And she mates with this and makes him Typhoeus. And he's the, the descriptions of him, I don't think are ever the same, but I think that's kind of his nature. He's this 
his his name means something more like whirlwind, but in this way of like connected to these words that mean like a big hollow or 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 the deeps, which is essentially what chaos. The the word chaos is just the big gaping abyss, and so. And so his name is something like that. And then he ends up, uh, oh, and he has like a hundred snake heads uh, and they all like all have burning fiery eyes and and they all have stormy voices. Um, uh, But, you know, some of them have him like, you know, he's got, he's got a hundred snakes for legs and a hundred snakes for arms and he has an ass head or something like that like he's he just keeps changing how he looks he ends up um he doesn't seem to live very long in greek mythology before zeus takes lightning bolts to him catches him on fire and nearly burns the world to pieces and then his body kind of smolders and rots away in tartarus uh, but apparently before he did he hooked up with a chitinus and, and she's this uh, she's a lot like him. In fact, she's not that she's not easy to distinguish except that she he's male and she's female. That seems to be the only consistent part of the story. And her upper half is a beautiful woman and her lower half are just this, this mess of serpents and, 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 and serpentine dragon like monsters and mm-hmm. together now that now, the the list of children varies depending on what the source but if you go with the coolest combination of sources together when they make kids they have the hydra uh cerberus or, or Caribus, depending on how you pronounce it uh the chimera the sphinx the nimian lion scylla even the gorgons uh, even the eagle that eats Prometheus's liver out every day is is their kid. Now, there some say, well, the Sphinx didn't involve Typhoeus. That was Echidna uh, mating with her, one of her own children, uh, a different one. Okay, maybe, but but sometimes Typhoeus gets credited for Sphinx as well. And so, pretty much all the cool Greek monsters are 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 his kids or their kids, I think, which is which is pretty cool. And that same thing happens in the Mesopotamian tale where you have this serpent like dragon of water and storms uh, spewing out monster after monster after monster and destroying the gods and shows up in other tales as well. In fact, to get really out on a limb, um, I think we have evidence that this story was cut out of the original text that ended up forming the Bible. I think we have, well, I know we have hints of it. There, there's no doubt about that, especially in Job, but elsewhere, that the original story was Yahweh took a sword to Tehom. Uh, and fought her and chopped her up and used her body uh, to create the world. And that kind of gets, that got edited out <laughs> along the way. And so all you have to do is deal with with hints, whether they're direct references or linguistic hints. Um, but it really all started with that Mesopotamian story, which is at least 4,000 years old, but probably a lot older. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot going on, <laughs> obviously there. Um and um, I just thought it was uh, kind of always interesting that um, you do hear of, you know, gods and monsters, but of course, uh, Typhon or Typhoeus, he is both, right? He is, a, he is, he is God and monster um, at the same time. And, um, and uh, that, I don't know, I, I just always found found the story kind of fascinating and then that uh, he would be the father of like you said some of the coolest uh, monsters in greek mythology yeah and, and he's and he's whether you look at him or you look at a kaidna uh, you know it's all this it's all this snake serpent stuff it, you know one of the reasons i'm connecting it so freely to other myths and tales is because of that in part because of that serpent monster stuff that chaos storm water themes too but he was even raised by python like like the python capital p i guess which all other pythons come from uh because gaia like had to have 
somebody as a babysitter for him, I guess, when he was growing up. <laughs> and so she said the Python, uh, Apollo later killed this Python and almost the same, same story that Zeus killed uh, Typhoeus or Marduk killed Tiamat or, or, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so there's all this snake stuff. And so that brings up these big questions like why, why serpents? Why always serpents? And especially when it's this monster that that is something of chaos and something of water, but it also has something of creation or, or of wisdom or of rebirth behind it after you conquer it. Um, or maybe that's just the thing it offers. And, you know, you see that all the way from the Garden of Eden over to Mesopotamia, over to Greece, whatever it is, you have this in, initial kind of uh, serpent-like monster that promises danger, and, and, but also promises wisdom or, or creation too. Um, there are a lot of answers to what's up with that, but I think we're probably already out of time. <laughs> I mean, it would take it would take at least an hour or two to yeah. get into all those. Yeah, and we have been going on now for for a long time. Uh, kind of like what we had said. Our our, our first uh, uh, thought was we we're going to run out of time. Um, but yes, I, I think there is something to that. It's it's always a serpent. So there is something very deep uh, about that uh, there. It's always a serpent or a serpent-like thing. Um, you know, I did tease. We were going to talk about the golem. I mean, if we can talk about the golem in like five minutes um, or 10 yeah. minutes, um, you know, I, I would like to do that. We've probably, you know... Um, uh, probably should limit ourselves to one topic from here on out, but hopefully they make good <laughs> podcasts. But um, so the Golem uh, is interesting. Now, everybody, of course, who plays Dungeons and Dragons is going to be familiar with the monster, uh, the Golem, and the different types. There are flesh golems, there are rock golems, there are clay golems, there are uh, iron golems. Um, there are all kinds of golems, but uh, the golem had a kind of an unusual start in mythology, didn't it? Yeah, the uh, the golem um, has a uh, like has a home and an original substance, and so we know a lot <laughs> about him because he's he's a much more recent tale. Now, it, the word golem, um, and I'll probably slip into calling it golem with using my the the way I always said it from from Kentucky. My Kentucky accent kind of does that to stuff, so, <laughs> but I think golem is probably more technically correct. Um, you know, the the word shows up in the bible and it shows up elsewhere but the 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 creature itself as this kind of monster is kind of recent and he's from prague uh where where my show i am told is number 15 in podcasts <laughs> of arts and literature <laughs> to slide that self-promotion in uh and i think it's because they make monsters there uh it, it, i think it's no coincidence that you know, a few cent well, a handful of centuries later, after the famous Golem tales uh, or Golem tales out of Prague come along, that you have a playwright who invents the ideas of robots. Um, that started in Prague as well. And uh, a guy wrote this play, R U R, Rossum's Universal Ro Universal Robots, and robots was just a, a shortening of Robotnik, which was essentially just a servant, mechanical servants. And the story essentially, we make these android robotic servants they rise up and they fight back at their masters and kill us <laughs> that's the same <laughs> robot story we're still telling and you know he he started that late 1800s uh, but another one started before him right there in the same city and it's this thing formed out of clay so the original golem was a clay golem and and all the rest of them are i guess variations on it and and th there are many different variations to the tale, but one of them also involve a real historical person. You can go to his house and see the attic where he made the golem. Uh, he was Rabbi Low. That's L O E W. I'm, you're probably supposed to pronounce it differently than that. And and he made he made this thing uh, in at least one version of the story as a way to defend the Jewish ghettos uh, from the the various anti-Semitic attacks and laws that were being leveled on them by the Holy Roman Empire at the time. 
Um, so we're dealing now in about the 1500s. And you bring this thing to life by using a key magical word, whether you, uh, a shem essentially, which is like one of the many names of Yahweh or God, Yahweh. Um, and you use a shem, uh, in this case, emet, which means truth. And you like put it in his mouth or you carve it into his head or you give him a necklace that says that and it brings him to life and then he does your bidding and like a lot of these kinds of stories it doesn't take very long before he takes his orders too literally and he starts rampaging and killing innocent people <laughs> and then they have to the fight is to stop this thing that you made you you wanted to play with powers that were that were perhaps beyond your control but you thought you could control it and now it's gotten out of control and now it's a killing monster and you've got to stop it that's the frankenstein story that's the robot story i think and one of the earliest that really gets it is that golem story uh so i i don't know if that's five minutes but that's a that's an <laughs> overview <laughs> no, no that's great uh that's a fantastic uh recap there and i think it is interesting i mean uh, of course coming from the uh you know kind of from mythology or kind of from that angle you could see why of course they were all clay or they were all dirt because um uh the word you know in hebrew golem it's just like stuff or or substance yeah. or what the very the very kind of most base thing that you are made of the 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 most essential thing that you're made of and of course uh adam was made of dust so um you know forming the golem out of clay makes you know, absolute sense. I think all of the other ones, like the flesh golem, the rock golem, and the iron golem, were added to give a, a, a role playing game more variation. <laughs> obviously, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, and I think, if you figure out the clay thing, maybe you could experiment with other substances too. <laughs> yeah, and you're right. It was, you know, it was in the original tales. There's a whole lot of of mirroring of the creation of Adam, Adam being like red clay or red yeah. earth, like he was formed out of, and it was like a mimic of that kind of thing in in the golem that i have in my novel black palace um i end up having him carved out of stone carved out of the same stone that the tablets of the ten commandments uh were carved out of um and along the akaba and uh in mine his programming is essentially all the commandments carved across his body. And so you could tell him, you could give him orders, but he first has to run it through. Does this violate any of the commandments? And to make it more complicated, we have him have both sets of 10 commandments. You know, we have the Northern Israel set and the Southern Israel set or the Northern kingdom and not Israel, but the Northern kingdom and the Southern kingdom, both of which, you know, we're in the Bible to further confuse everything. <laughs> and so anything you tell him, he has to run this through. Like, is this technically stealing? You know, what day of the week is this? Like before he can do anything. And uh, I don't know, it's just a blind. Anytime you have a character that's persnickety uh, and over literal, uh, then it's just a blast for, for scene writing. <laughs> 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 well, there's a lot there. I'm glad you brought in your own novel there as well. Um, and of course, you've you've already touched on it quite a bit. I mean, the 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 idea of this a servant or something that is not alive, but you can give it kind of the 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 properties of living, you know. The, but um, you can give it the properties or the of the illusion of life or something that, and then we realize it is not under our control. Of course, you know, as you mentioned too, I think you said we've been telling that same story <laughs> now for, um, I don't yeah. know, uh, several hundred years at least. And, and it's does seem to have hit. Um, I don't know if it is with the industrial revolution or with uh, um, the way things have gone in modern society. It's just, uh, can we create something that gets out of control um, is, is, kind of one of our main themes it seems like yeah yeah i mean and we're, and we're having a i don't know how many people have have started accepting that they're going to have to face this fear but for a while in the the height of industrialization fear was something like now you have to worry about robots taking your job right and so mm -hmm. You know, some people go, you know, trying to seek out careers or select a college degree, 
we've got to figure out, am I making myself robot proof? But now we have AI. <laughs> and, and if you're like most people, you've already talked to customer service representatives that weren't people, they were robots. And the third generation of AI or the fourth generation coming out soon is that much more impressive and they can they can sustain conversations better than real people and the ones that i've had with with ai uh the you know knowing what i'm knowing that i'm interacting with ai um and so now you've got to worry about making yourself ai proof like if you're a computer programmer your job's about to get taken by ai right so you're no longer ai proof and how do you make yourself how do you make yourself immune to something that's pure intellect who can figure out how to interact with other people better than you can, who can do anything that involves intellectual skill? Um, if you're a graphic designer, you're out of the job soon. AI is going to do it, man. <laughs> so uh, you can tell I want a pretty picture of beach. I want it to be kind of a happy, but slightly dangerous kind of moment with young people. Boom, it's done. Right. And it's already figured that out. And like if in seconds and you don't have to pay somebody $200 an hour to create that magazine cover, like how in the world are you going to do? I don't know if that doesn't scare you yet, then maybe you don't think about monsters as much as I do, but you know, <laughs> we've got, all, we've got all sorts of monsters rising up all around us. And, yeah. And maybe what we need is a hero, like the kinds you play on <laughs> D and D and other various <laughs> role-playing games to go out and find ways to beat the unbeatable monster. So a modern day Marduk to slay the uh, AI Tiamat. Exactly. Exactly. Not to sound too much like Jordan Peterson, but maybe he's onto something there. <laughs> I don't know. Gosh. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I know it's, uh, I'm not too, uh, I'm not too into the theory that AI is going to take everything, but it is, it is a little freaky when you, I, I, I have to admit that when you see, I was looking at some paintings that were done by AI and some things like this and, you know, and stories written by AI and you're just like, Oh, that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> you know, it's just <laughs> like, what, you know, but, you know, are, you know, I, I don't know. It does kind of bring up that, that fear, right. That, um, um, like as we were talking about with the Borg, right. We're going to lose yeah. our, our identities, right. To the thing, <laughs> to the, whatever it is, to the, uh, to the mindless or, you know, you know, just this, the thing that just does stuff, right. That just reproduces and moves and, uh, and we're going to lose ourselves in that or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a real, it's a real fear. Uh, and you know, you don't have to, even if you don't, I don't know, it doesn't take that much imagination, uh, to know that if it's not exactly like that, some similar type of battle is just going to keep arising up. And until we have, I don't know, a bootlerian jihad, like they did in Dune, <laughs> and then we can wipe out all the, all the thinking robots. I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's the next move we should make. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, maybe it'll happen. <laughs> yeah. Um well, Josh, uh, yeah, we've went over time again and I could still keep talking to you <laughs> about stuff, but um I should definitely let you go. I mean, we have a lot of information here that people can think about when they're creating monsters or are running different campaigns, the different ideas that they could work in there, um try to reclaim the golem a little bit and make him scary again instead of just a creature with 238 hit points or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, before I let you go, Josh, where can people find your podcast and your novels? Oh yeah. Thank you for, uh, I've already been shamelessly plugging anyway, but <laughs> thanks for the, and, uh, yeah, you can check me out at joshwoodsauthor.com or, uh, or just or find the podcast pretty much anywhere that has podcasts uh, and that's called the monster professor or you could just google josh woods but then you're going to get a whole bunch of josh woods's <laughs> there there are there are clans of us out there and i'm i'm the geeky one who does writing and monsters and stuff like that so um but joshwoodsauthor.com is like is the base website where i have uh my books you can also find them on amazon barnes and nobles target and now that kind of stuff so you can find my books around um 
there as well. So, and again, as always, Matt, it's a blast. Uh, it's really fun talking with you. That's one of the reasons why I keep, I keep, uh, joining you every time I get an invite and I keep wanting to have you on the podcast. So, uh, it's another jo- jo- uh, Matt and Josh show and it's been a blast. <laughs> Well, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing uh, your knowledge of monsters and that. And it's always a pleasure to be on your show. And uh, like I said, I could keep talking to you because I could ask you a million more questions (laughs) Um, and it would probably devolve into Star Trek or video games or something at some point. But uh, who cares? (laughs) But um, anyway, Josh, um, thank you so much for being on the show again. My pleasure, man. Thank you. All right, there you have it. Man, it is always a ton of fun to have Josh on the show. I really hope you enjoyed today's interview. We had an awesome time talking about types of monsters, about golems, about Typhon or Typhonus or whatever his name is. As you can tell, Josh just possesses a wealth of knowledge about monsters and it is always good to tap into that so we can improve our role-playing games if you want to help josh out you can listen to his podcast i really suggest that you do the monster professor podcast is awesome and you can also check out some of josh's books he is an incredible writer and you don't want to miss those so As always, I have provided links in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com. Head over there, check those out, support Josh's work. You won't be disappointed. If you want some free stuff, head over to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You'll get 10 free dungeon maps. You'll never miss an episode of this show. And each and every Friday, you will get an email update from me letting you know what is going on in this wide, wonderful world of Dice Geeks. Now, hey, guys, if you like this show, please consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is just patreon.com slash dice geeks. I would really appreciate it. Any support I receive there just lets me know that I should keep making these episodes. All right, guys, I really thank you so much for listening. And until next Wednesday, keep gaming.